have to work with people that have the same vision as you. With all of these resources, how can we improve people's careers? Just think bigger than where you're at right now. The only way you can be freeing your art is to be able to make your own institution. A lot of African artists always accept gifting, but they've never had high quality campaign deals. <laughs> This conversation in particular is about thriving um, beyond the canvas. Some of Lagos, Nigeria, and the world's best artists that we have right now emerging in multiple fields, mostly mixed media. Um, my name is Nate Abetu. Um, I'm an emerging creator. Um, I'll be facilitating the conversation today, um, and I'll hand over to everyone to their introductions. That's okay. Uh, <clears throat> hi guys. Uh, my name is Leo. Uh, also called Soldier. I make toys, I paint camouflage, and I do like a bunch of design stuff. Hi, I'm um, Oscar Seven, I'm an urban artist and a visual storyteller. Hi. Ooh. Hi, my name is Ni Okeo, okay, I'm an art director and a graphic designer. Hi, my name is Anthony Azekwa, artist and author. Hi, um, I'm Paul Arigi, I'm a visual artist and photographer. Hi, my name is Renny Pear. I'm a visual artist and illustrator. Well, Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sat, sat with greatness, real greatness. Um, but I guess it takes a lot to become as big as you all are in your individual practices. So I kind of maybe want to open the floor by asking like, what inspires you to still engage with the art scene and, and, and the industry as a whole as creatives? I feel like it's like uh, the need to tell stories. You know, I feel like from all of us, we all have our own like, individual and unique perspectives on life growing up. And in terms of actually just telling the stories to people and having people connect with them and having people kind of see themselves in what's being painted, what's being like sculpted, what's being crafted. Like there's a kind of unity about it. Everybody being able to share that experience. Yeah, it's really valid and important. Could you maybe like explain a little bit of what was your inspiration bringing to the table? Um, I'm mostly inspired by self-image and uh, collective history. Sometimes music got to me more, it's mostly self-image. I think I'm just inspired by life. Like I just like observing things and trying to deconstruct them in many layers or different fields as possible. Um, I'm inspired by life, like you said, um, and we need to tell stories. Um, we need to inspire people with your own journey, because for me, that's something that has been constant, like getting people to be inspired with the kind of artwork you put there or the kind of film of movie you make. Um, I'm inspired by the cool shit I like. So if I like a color today, I'm going to try and recreate that color. Or if I like a piece of design, I'm going to try and recreate the piece of design. So for me, it's just like telling people, oh, I like this, so I'm going to make this. I love that. Yeah, it's important to feel what you're creating first before you can, right? Yeah, literally. But then, do you feel like a lot of your work is seen, and this is a question for all of you, there's a lot of that scene, that work seen in the industry. I mean, there's a lot of emerging scenes in Lagos alone, with like Rene Gallery, and a lot of like smaller ones, or the work that Oyen Khan's doing right now with Dada. But do you feel like your work is platformed in those spaces and that your narratives are shared in the ways that we want to? Uh, I hate galleries. I hate the art industry. I think it's very boring and very commercial. So I avoid putting my work in galleries, but at the same time, many galleries kind of reach out to me. But for me, the whole industry is like fake. I don't really fuck with it. But that's my perspective. I see a lot of heads nodding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like with the galleries, it's with social media now, like all of us have like our social media platforms and like you're posting that straight to the people who actually care. You know, sometimes with the galleries, with the industry, it can feel very commercial and like what being used as like props, you know, as little stickers for like someone else's like product and price tag. So, you know, in today's world, like when you talk about platforms, you know, included now is the new platform of the artists themselves and how they themselves go straight to the viewers, the consumers, like, and you turn those people into collectors. So that's kind of like this new shift that's been happening with like the digital media over the last couple of years where it's like, oh, now people can have their own galleries because the artists themselves functions in that way. 
in terms of how they relate to their work and also how they relate to the external like uh, parties. Personally, I hate the um, I hate the restrictions that come with like having to like work with gallery. It's just it's just like there's a particular way it has to go. There is a particular flow. There's a particular there are certain things you have to do. There are certain things you don't have to do. And as an artist, I feel like that's limiting. Do you understand? And it's really hard to actually find like foundations or galleries that will actually just let you do what you do. And then even the ones who let you do what you do, sometimes they're like issues with like say funding and all that. Do you understand? When you have like so much ideas, it's like think big and then you think big, you bring the ideas and then there's no funding for it. Do you understand? So like most times, yeah, I feel like I would rather do like self projects. Do you understand? Yeah, self projects. But yeah, I don't like the restrictions of coming galleries. I was gonna ask, what kind of restrictions do you have, like, with the gallery, like? Well, there's usually like a particular way to go. It's just like when you're, um, how do I put it? Say you're working in an organization, you have to probably okay. You're in the military, you have to go through one particular stage and then graduate to another stage and all that. It all just feels it feels like really. Is it automated? So sort of, do you understand? Okay, so let me let me let me let me explain this. Um, there are some of my parents, some of my colleagues, who who told me actually that because the gallery said that okay, their page has to look a particular way, so they have to like take down like old posts and all that, take out personal things. Do you understand? I feel like that's kind of like taking away the whole idea of actually like being an artist because it's supposed to be you're supposed to be true, right? Yeah, exactly. So why are you taking down like things that because someone said you have to? That's just like one scenario. Do you understand? Yeah. Um, how do you reclaim your freedom, knowing that you want to be free as an artist? For me, uh, I think I'm actually a rebel. What I want is what I want. I always find a way to get it. And if I'm not getting what I want through a gallery, I try to like, I won't just do it. Do you understand? Except I actually like realize along the line that I've actually fallen in something that I probably didn't want to get into. Say they call me in form of like, they just pretend. Do you understand? But most times you just have to rebel. Like, st stand for what you want. Galleries who actually like give a fuck about you would allow you just do you. I think for me, from the beginning, because I, I practice both digitally and traditionally, but I'm mostly a digital artist. And from the time I noticed that galleries and, you know, they just did not like digital artists. I don't know if they don't like us or they don't know how to exhibit our works and all of that, but there have been situations where there, we've seen digital art exhibitions, I'm not going to mention names, and its quality has been horrible. So I think the galleries and that scene, I think they hate digital artists. So since I have um, because what's happening is that digital artists are creating or recreating that space for themselves. Look at Anthony. Anthony curating exhibitions for digital artists to come together and exhibit because the traditional art scene is not, you know, providing for us or they are not paying attention to us. And since I noticed, when I entered the industry and I noticed that was what was going on, I rebelled against it. I just thought, oh, I don't even need you. Like, go away. I'm going to find a way to put my stuff out there. I'm going to make money, I'm going to connect with like big people and you guys will watch me. So I think that's how I've reclaimed my freedom by generally not just you know, caring about if I'm in a gallery or if I'm in a museum or not. And there is like this stigma attached to it that if you are not, if you do not exhibit in these places, then you are not really an artist. So there is also that happening. And since then, and just watching everything, I'm just like, I don't care. If I get to exhibit or get to, I'm not, I do not put myself under pressure to be um, seen a certain way as an artist. Like, the way I present myself, like, it is what it is. Yeah. To add to what she said, it's crazy how um, digital art actually, like, made me the most money before I actually even started doing traditional art. Like, I was drawing straight from my phone. And that was what actually got me to, like, at least, or that was like what kickstarted this whole career, yeah. No, yeah, definitely. I feel like because it got to a point where, you know, we had all been sharing work on the internet for years. And it's like there are people that are taking notice. And if you look at it, like what is a gallery? Like a gallery is really a space that's holding art. You know, like in terms of reclaiming, we realized that in 2021, we're like, you know what? If we rent out this space, make it white, print out the art. If you don't like it, it's no problem, we'll print it out. 
and we distribute that to people who want to buy. Like in that sense, we've created that ecosystem from nothing. And I feel like seeing more and more people kind of embrace that model and method of distribution and also holding the work has been very important. I generally don't think they're going to embrace that because the art scene is also very classist. So like... Yeah, I feel like embraced by the people really because it's, at the end of the day it's like Okay, the so not, not by the classist yeah, the, collectors. Yeah, the industry is going to catch up how the industry wants to catch up. But I think for us the important thing has been people. Like to be a collector you don't have to have 500,000 million. Da, 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 da. Like to be a collector all you have to do is collect art. And being able to make that distinction and be able to bring it down so that everybody can participate. Like even in London, for instance, people like Cortez um, and Clint them, I saw and Sloan, what they did in terms of fashion and being able to bring that point where the regular person is able to partake in the brand and the work is something that really, really comes to mind in methods like this. And it really does break down the classes barriers sometimes in, in the art world, right? Like the fact that you can build your own audience and grow in different spaces. I, I completely get what you mean about the the elitism of it, like art in itself is like such a weird space because sometimes these collectors will buy your pieces just because you're in a certain gallery, for sure. But I think the best collectors are looking for some sort of archival value. Um, I think we've been speaking a lot about restoration in the art scene here in, in Lagos especially, right? Like whether it's a Ben in Bronze or the works that you guys are making to capture your experiences right now, it's about how do we tell stories for the future. So I, I love the conversation, I'm definitely down for it. I, I want to know more. Um, you three have been a bit, bit, little bit silent about like what makes you feel free. Like, how do you express yourself within the space? Um, for me, I've never really, you know, worked with a gallery because of the kind of art I, you know, create. Um, even from the jump, it's the conversation went south because I went to a couple of galleries, asking, "Oh, let's have an urban graffiti exhibition," and everybody said no. You know. I had to go to the care showroom and I had like a solo exhibition there and pretty much that's where it kicked off for me and I just realized that, you know what, I really don't need a gallery for where I'm going to. So I built a team around me, you know, so, and I've been with that team for over seven years now, you know, and we just done our thing so far and it's been great, you know, for me, that's my own idea of freedom is creating what you want when you want, you know, and I've just been more brand centric. So I do more brand works, you know, and, you know, personal stuff. Uh, I personally uh, don't believe freedom in art actually exists. I mean, the only way you can be free in your art is to be able to make your own institution. So if you can't get into a gallery, I believe you can make your own gallery. And, uh, and I feel like more younger people should actually do that more. Um, I think from because a lot of my work is grounded in graphic design and not necessarily art, I've never really had to go to an art gallery. I'm always leveraging on maybe new technology to sort of showcase my art. So maybe it's AR or, um, or maybe billboards or just like doing um, projections. So like I try and use as much of everything except for a gallery to display my work. My work usually ends up on t-shirts or merch. So I've never really had to like seek an art gallery in the sense because my work is mostly digital. So I'm more of using like merchandise and other alternative means. And I'm very DIY so I tend to do a lot of things in like a small capacity so that I can easily just scale. Because you go to a gallery and the next year you have to follow it up and if you can't get a gallery you now start to feel like maybe you're not succeeding. So I like to just pace myself. And a lot of my principles are grounded on like my mortality, so I tend not to stress myself in institutions. If I need to get a message out there, I would find a way to get it out there, with or without the galleries. Yeah, yeah I feel that. It sounds like um, all the tools that we need for the institutions of the future aren't really here right now, but you're all thriving, and you're all people like shaping and de defining like, what the art scene in, in Africa is looking like for the world right now. So what would the institution of the future look like for you guys? How, how can we create the basis and the foundation to thrive with the sorts of works that you're creating? I was going to say that I feel like an ideal institution is just really simply is the one that gives the power to the artist. Like, you know, you can have your cut or whatever, but I feel like the artist is the best person in position to say how their work should look, how it should feel, how it should really hit the people. 
And of course, sometimes there's like a lot more nuanced business conversations on the other side. But I feel like that foundation, like it hasn't been left with artists for so long. Because it's like with music, you know, everybody has so much data that they're like, look, you know, we drop the art on this day, we bring this person and we make sales. And it's become very algorithm, it's become very like automatic. But in this new space that we're in, I feel like more and more, the artists should be part of those conversations and be able to say, look, like, this is what I think, this is how I feel, like, this is exactly where I'm trying to get to. And like, let's all go to it together, as opposed to this, uh, you know, employer-employee relationship. I think, um, to just add to what you said, yeah, I think um, galleries are actually supposed to, like, work for the artists. That's how it should be, but yeah, like it's, most times it seems like we artists are like workers, so to speak. Do you understand? So like, yeah, I'm just adding to what you said. Like it should be the other way around because you should be able to listen to the artist at least, know what they want, try to at least do what they want. Sometimes advice definitely, but galleries are supposed to work, yeah, with or for the artists. Yeah. Are there any other tools? I feel like, what about in the digital space? If there's no institutions that are ready to showcase your work that have the technology or the space or the, just the curatorial vision to like scale up like some sculptures that you're making in a, in a different world, like what foundations could there be in other ways? That's the thing. The funny thing is that a lot of us have had to build those structures from the ground up. Like, you know, all those links that you would need to do this or that, we've kind of had to make those connections by ourselves because institutionally, there wasn't anything that quite existed yet to fulfill that specific need. Because, you know, a lot of us are creating work either on screens or like on walls, like with graffiti. And like, the industry hadn't caught up to that yet because to them, they're confused, like, how does this work? So for us, we had to kind of directly fulfill that need and go straight to market. I also feel like the digital art scene right now is a bit chaotic with um, very fleeting um, new inventions and like it's, it's quite unstable even with the NFT scene and now AI and we're fighting for our lives. <laughs> so <laughs> the digital art scene, I think because it's um, connected to technology, it grows and moves and changes very quickly. So it's a bit difficult to um, like catch up and create based on what um, you know other people are doing like at the moment. I think now the NFT scene is not as um, crazy as it was then because of crypto, and now there is AI, and it, it, it's just a very it's a very weird scene. And I feel like if we are going to build something or a stable structure around the digital art scene, we have to be ready to accept just changes and work with it very quickly so that it benefits the entire community. Yeah, yeah. I think collaboration. There's always someone that has what you don't have. So when you guys come together, you can leverage off each other. For me, I, I do a lot of um, merch design. And the company that I work with was someone I met like six years ago. And we've just sort of maintained that relationship. So we've kind of done like an exchange of service. I offer like design, design services and in return, I get access to their infrastructure. And it has got to the point now where I'm now like a director in the company, like I'm part of the company, just off of that relationship. So sometimes when people complain about not being able to sell their merch, I can't relate because I've collaborated long term with someone that sort of has given me their platform. And they've also leveraged off my own platform. So I'll say collaboration is the way we can avoid all these pitfalls. So there's like building this value exchange between yourself and others. Yeah, value exchange, yeah. Yeah, yeah. trying together. And choosing new mediums as well, that's like really interesting because now you're like, cool, you make art, but you're fitting it into a completely different space. Like, um, what was taking you into that space? What was it that pushed you there? And, and how is it beneficial to your practice now? Oh, I think like by acquiring like different skill sets from different, um, yeah. Also, there's just something very nice about being able to tell your story in different, like trans um, media marketing, where you can tell your stories through merch, gaming, um, toys, um, arts installations, exhibitions. Yeah, I hope I answered the question. Um, work, working with other mediums is quite important. 
For example, as an artist, whenever you make a piece of canvas, it can be very expensive. But the best thing to do is then make a print of that canvas, and that way you can make like more money, but give it to more people. So kind of like doing things like, okay, making t-shirts, uh, making prints, maybe working on NFTs, ETC, does help your income stream, you know what I mean? So it's worth exploring those other mediums. Even making music, you don't, you don't have to limit yourself. It's kind of limitless. Um, for me, I would say getting the right team or building the right team around yourself could also help you scale up faster. Um, I'll use myself as an example. I have a business manager, I have a road manager, you know, I have an admin team. Um, last year, for example, we, we executed about 105 murals across um, the country, you know, and that was just like my whole team. I wouldn't have done that if it were just me, you know, so I would say getting the right team can help you scale and, you know, get your business like up faster. You know, you have to learn to break bread. You have to pay people. You have to delegate, you know, or else you just get swamped with what you're doing. No, but I feel like that's really true um, because I worked in music for a while, like doing cover arts and all those things. So I really studied a lot of how that structure worked and I realized that, oh, it was never just the artists. Like, the artists will have, you know, their managers. You're having, like, uh, people who handling your press. You have maybe, like, your assistant there. You have... It was a very like tight network, but it worked all in collaboration to that one goal. So even realizing that putting together my own team and us being able to execute things on like a bigger level, because at a point like there's only so much you can go. Like you said, like you can't really go across the whole of Nigeria. You're doing everything by hand, you know. So I think it's great like collaborating with people and also having that team and that support structure beside you as you all go to that vision is really cool. I think um, also like. Uh like leasing or lo loaning your arts to like say organizations or I mean there are some hotels that actually like accept like works where you can just put in their space and then they help you like try to sell it or um, it just uh, kind of like exposes you to like another another kind of crowd who might find interest in your piece and want to buy it so I think like taking advantage of that too sometimes can also help Okay, um, I think by specializing and also improving your skills as an artist, when you are able to do, so it's a, it's a touchy topic because sometimes people say you should specialize and at other times people say you should explore and just try different things to see what works. I think for me, I've um, done more of the latter than the former, so I'm mostly just trying stuff and creating stuff and creating different ways to, you know, put, that, um, put those things out there and sell to people. I really like what Leo said about um, prints because that's how I make passive income, by just creating and, and dropping it somewhere and then it's selling somewhere. From commissions as well, I know artists hate taking commissions, <laughs> but I feel, like <laughs> I feel like that's really a good place to also get you know, income if, you know, it's a project that you are interested in. I know it can be very stressful to work on something that you're not interested in just for the money. So if you get to the point where you are able to pick your projects and pick who you want to collaborate with, then that's also a good source of, you know, income. So collaborations, commissions, merch, yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, commissions actually like help sometimes in a good way. I mean, we, we shouldn't always look at it in a bad way. I personally, I still take commissions, but I have like a particular period in a year where I'm open to take commissions. So once I've crossed the number of commissions I'm taking for the year, I can't do more than that because I know how much or how much I can give into another person's idea. Do you understand? And one of the things I appreciate about commissions is um, the fact that someone is actually like coming up with like a theme and asking you to create something. So it's not just something that, how do I put it? It's not just something that you're completely, um, should I say curating? Do you understand? Someone is just exposing you to a newer way of seeing things. Do you get? Yeah. Yeah, so like I know there is like a mindset around commissions and I think, um, I'm very pro-commissions. I think my, my artist friends know it. Um, because 
I feel like the skills that I have today, or the skills that I, the things that I've learned today, I've learned them mostly from commissions. I've learned them from someone looking at me and saying, oh, you do this, and me saying, no, I've never done it before. And the person says, oh, try. And then it works, and I like it. And then I make it a part of my thing. So I feel like, like we should try. There are some people that can't. They're just unable to work with people when creating. And that doesn't make them less of you know, who they are as artists. But I think more artists should you know, give commissions a try. <laughs> yeah, I think with commissions, I mean, because I was doing like cover art, but this was almost two years ago, my last one. And I feel like it was just so high intensity, man, especially in music, because you're working across like, someone can just call you on Wednesday and they're like, bro, I beg, the song is dropping on Friday. Like, you know, let's quickly do something. I was like, bro. Okay. Like you get, so I feel like there are ways to manage it. There are ways to regulate. No, no, no. Me. <laughs> I feel like there are ways to control how you. In, me. <laughs> I feel. <laughs> the thing is, artists um, as musicians, they're very erratic people. So it's like. Oh, sorry. I'm not talking about musicians. Now I'm talking about um, visual artists oh, and okay. I thought you mean like musicians. No, no, no. I don't know anything about the oh, music shit. scene. So I'm, I'm saying there are ways to regulate the client-artist relationship, like with visual artists, so that it's not too hard on you as an artist, and so that you have um, more control over, you know, how it's executed. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of commissions always go crazy because you didn't set a time scale. You didn't put a scope of work in place. There's no contracts, and you just saw money at one point. Um, and that's a big part of it, right? And finding the boundaries where you end and where they begin, right? So that like the creativity flows. Um, do you have any advice yeah. for creatives who are just trying to make something gonna, happen? I was going to say that Nii had, I was, Nii had an advice. You had first advice point of contact with your client. So they should never have to reach you directly. Exactly. Because they never, still boils down like, to team. They can't just you call know. you on the phone. There needs to be someone that is in the middle. Because even though you're going to be deep asleep by 12 a.m. and somebody's calling you that we need to cover art the next day. And like, artists or people will push you that far where they will call you in the middle of the night. So you need to make sure you're not the first point of contact between you and your client. There needs to be somebody there answering emails or phone calls. You if know, you some, can't afford one for now, make it look like somebody else is doing it, even if it's you, but like, oh, sorry, we'll get back to you, nee, uh, Mr. Nee is not around, that kind of thing. Because yeah. once they can violate that boundary, they'll violate it, I promise you. I used to have an email called Linda on the site, and Linda <laughs> would chase my invoices. You know, no, definitely, I feel like there was a time, this is almost three years ago now, um, I had a viral painting, and then Duro, he said, Anthony, I need to call you, and then he called me, and then for an hour, he was like, gave me like proper advice on everything I shouldn't do. And the first thing he told me was, bro, never give any of these people your number. And like, I forgot about this thing. And I remember I was just like, yeah, I said, yeah, take. And like, you're getting funny calls at like 3 a.m. And you're like, bro, like, see, the product is tomorrow, da, 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 da. which is no problem in that. But then if you can manage it, you know, so it always helps to have that support structure in place to help you through those times and help manage things as much as possible with contracts, with timelines and all those things because it can get very hectic at times. Yeah, I agree. I think structure, structure is very, very important because um, one thing about being you know, an artist and how it allows us to express ourselves how we want, how the career just allows us to be very expressive is that we forget that once you start to make money from art, it's no longer just it's all, it has become a business, and you should treat it like a business, especially if you're interacting with strangers, with random people, you know, around the world. And I think, like, honestly, you should just put, like what Ni nee said, people shouldn't, like, there is, people just think artists, uh, there's this, um, I don't know what's free, I don't know, I've forgotten the word, but it's, People associate some form of anyhowness to artists. I don't know if that's a word, but you get. So they always assume that they can, or we as artists can be treated anyhow. Um, and I think you enforcing that structure when it comes to relating with clients sort of curbs it or makes them like makes them understand that okay, so this is not just an artist client thing; it's a business. I personally believe there should be contracts. Um, like Osa said, you should have a team to help you with these things. If you don't have a team and you're a bit business-minded, 
there should be contracts, there should be invoices. Um, nobody calls me to make inquiries because my number is not even out there, right? And if you call me, I'll tell you to send me an email. Now, I'm not saying that you should, um, emails are like the only way to communicate with, you know, assists and all, but when there is, when you take away the, the ease of access, there is some sort of respect associated with that boundary. So I feel like, you know, when we get to the point where we are relating a lot with clients and we're doing money talk, they need to understand that they are not just buying art, they are buying a service and they are buying a person's time and skill, like the skill an artist has built over the years and it's important to treat the artist as such. Yeah, but even to build up on that, it's like there's external structure, but there's also now internal structure as well, even especially when like team is involved, because I learned that. Because on our side now, for instance, you know, we're having weekly meetings. It's like I have my own deadlines. Like at a point, I was getting my own salary, you know, from my own company. And it's like it was very, very important that those structures were set because having good timelines, having that good discipline and having to be able to submit to that structure it, I mean, we're still having issues because it's hard. You know, as artists, we're not used to like having to submit to it, especially one that you created. But I realize that it's very, very important that like codes of conduct are set. Like the way things are being done should be set, especially inside and then outside as well, because it kind of helps foster this idea and culture of how things should be done. You know, because like you said, the minute you make your first cover from your art, automatically you're a business. Like the whole thing has changed. Because it's like you can be an artist and just be in your room and paint, and that's cool. But the minute you're liaising with people, now there's a business aspect out of it. And it's like either you handle it or someone else does. Either way, it has to be handled. And, but the beauty of it is you decide how that gets to be done. So that's amazing. And we've spoken so much about structure. Like, where did you guys start when it came to contracting, working out which members of staff you needed for your murals? Like, how do you know who the right people are? And like, where to find the resources? Because I feel like in the creative industry, a lot of people don't talk to each other. So like, where does, where does that come from for you? Uh, personally, uh, the way I kind of figure out my structure is the needs. So let's say if today I want to make toys, then I'm gonna look for like a 3D designer. And if it's someone I like, then I'm gonna like introduce him to the team, basically. So structure comes from like uh, your needs and your wants as an artist? I mean, I, for me, I put the word out and I look for people online. Um, because I'm currently into murals and graffiti and whatnot, there are a whole lot of people who are out there who do not have um, the platform to be put out there. So um, I look for them and I recruit. Um, apart from the OS7 brand, I also have a company called Inscribe. So Inscribe pretty much does what an OS7 can do. But to prevent burnout, um, we started that company. And also for clients who can afford an OS7 to paint your space, you know, we have um, a team who can cater for your needs um, with the same level of experience put into the work, you know, um, yeah. So for me, I just look for people online and try them out. If they're good, I keep them and yeah. Yeah, I think like proper research. For me, I like to go to design talks and all these conferences because you get to meet like like-minded people. And you guys can just say, oh, I'm working on this. What do you think of, do you want to work with me on this? That's how I find people to work with anyways. Or I just listen in on like, um, like Twitter spaces you can just tell when somebody is trying to build an idea and like, oh, I'm also trying to do stuff like this. Or either times, it's most, I like referrals because referrals are very personal. Like, if you ask somebody, they're giving you who they think is that person for you. I don't like throwing it out there on the internet because there's so many people that are just starting. So I just ask my, like, my community, like, oh, how far outside? Do you know somebody that can do this? And I was like, oh, I know this guy. You should talk to him. So stuff like that. It all boils down again to collaboration and... And it's like the power of relationships, right? Exactly, relationships. Like one thing all three of you guys have said, it's like the right vibe, the right person. Yeah. But you just see eye everybody, to eye. Oh, sorry. Everybody that I've worked with, I've worked with for the past at least six years consistently. So like there's a, so we trust each other. We sort of find ways to fund each other's businesses. So it's like, oh, they need something that has to do with design. They call me. They need something that has to do with merch production. I call my guy who is my partner. So stuff like that.
just expanding on community? Yeah, I feel like on our side, I've always just, uh, I've always asked questions. Like, I'm always in everybody's DMs. I'm like, yo, like, I really like your work. Like, how did you guys do that? How did you guys do that? That's how I met, like, Ni and Renika. Because I'm just messaging them randomly. I'm like, hi, I like your stuff. Like, how did you do this? How do I approach this? And, you know, more often than, more, more often than not, like, more, most people are very receptive to, like, just answering questions. I'm with you. And I feel like we said a lot about, like, people now. Um, and we got into the dark side of commissions. But for your practices, what's the good side of commissions? Like, why do you take a commission? Like, I take commissions because it's fun. <laughs> I'm joking. It reduces the <laughs> workload of having to come up with an original concept. Yeah. Because someone has done all that. It's like, oh, I need you to put Lionel Messi on top of Hellfire or something. You know? So that's an idea that you don't have to certainly research. They've already given you the framework and you can just build on it. Yeah. Or like an image of maybe Ronaldo winning the World Cup and there's already enough references for you to pull from and just add it there. So I think it saves you the stress of having to think of an original idea and just execute on it. I think commissions also put you in spaces that you wouldn't have thought you would be in if like you do not come in contact with these people. Um, I also think commissions stretch your skills. Um, you know, you learn a lot when you take commissions or when you're doing things that you never thought like you'd be able to come up with on your own. Um, I think commissions actually give you a wider reach to an extent. Um, for example, I have a Hennessy bottle. I have a collaboration with a Hennessy. Uh, I've made a Hennessy bottle and I didn't think I would have painted a random bottle and put it out there and, you know, but that commission got me like worldwide. So it's actually a good reach. You know, if you're working with the good, the right brand. Oh yeah, I feel like even from my time of doing covers, what was always cool was, you know, like the announcement, everybody's seeing it, and people being able to connect with your art and the music that's like they're listening to as well. There's that, like you said, like it's like a whole new audience as well that's been introduced to you. So I think that's one thing I really did love about like doing commissions and covers because it was kind of like an intro into a whole new audience, like. You know, with Adekone Gold's covers, Simi, like Masego, like those were cool projects that we were able to collaborate on and like enter new audiences as well. A commission led me to actually creating the Igbo Landing series. And I feel like if I wasn't given that commission, I wouldn't have known that there was anything about the Igbo Landing. And a lot of people who saw those pieces also didn't know there was anything about like the Igbo Landing. So, like, Aside from the work that I do or from like the things that inspire me, I feel like commissions are like brain games. Um, sometimes they're annoying, but um, they just allow you to explore like other things and just you just get knowledge from like other things that you never like thought of. And it's it's sort of when it goes right, when you've like closed like a good commission or a good project, it boosts your morale as an artist. You just feel really good that someone, you know, has come with an idea and you've brought the idea to life and they are happy and you are happy. Leo, what's been like one of your favorite commissions? I did a collaboration for um, True Religion like uh, last year. It was fun because uh, they gave me like full freedom to do whatever I wanted with like the denim. I think that was my third so far. Yeah, I guess it's, it's important with commissions as well to see the box, right? Like, if you have a tight brief, then you can just create something exciting. So it's nice to have the, the freer ones. Nice. And um, I guess part of the reason you guys are allowed to, to collaborate with such amazing brands and, and do these fun things with Hennessy, True Religion, etc., right, is because you've built, like, your names and your audience, right? Like, um, you've built your names and your audience. Like, people know who you are. Like, your names run through these streets. So what tips do you have for other artists who are trying to get to levels where you guys are in terms of building that audience, building that kind of reputation? Uh, be, being shameless with, like, promoting yourself. So many people think that, like, whenever they make art or, like, work, uh, suddenly someone's going to, like, fuck with them. But, like, no one cares. So whenever you make something amazing, you need to put yourself out there constantly, every day, 247, shamelessly. If you're able to do that, then maybe someone will care. Maybe someone will hear you. 
But if you make stuff and you keep it to yourself, I don't, I don't think you're an artist. Um, for me, I'll say two things. Um, one, consistency. You know, um, you can never go wrong doing the same thing, except you're doing the wrong thing. Just be sure of what you're doing. If you're sure and your purpose is clear, uh, just keep doing it. Someday it would, it would work. Um, secondly, do not, uh, do not put money first. You know, I like money, don't get it wrong, but I don't put it at the front of my business. You know, I put value. You know, what value am I offering this person or what value am I giving this person? you know, compared to, you know, money. The money will come definitely if you're providing the right value or the person is getting the right value for what you're doing, so yeah. I would say curiosity and always be a student. With curiosity, you're always going to want to find new ways to do things. You're going to stay fresh. You're not trying to just do what everybody's doing. You stay, you sort of go against the status quo if you're curious. And also being consistent, because consistency pays off long term. You might be here now, you're looking at it, it doesn't make sense, but when you actually look back, like maybe six months before, you'd find that you've definitely grown. So don't get too stuck up on the future, like actually focus on what you're doing at the moment. I'd also say find different mediums to share your work. There's so many free ways to spread your work. Like again, AR, like these, these apps, there's I think MetaSpark, like it's offering so many new ways to actually present your ideas. You can put stuff into it. It's, it's just very crazy. So I'll say also la latch onto new technology that might be free to help you spread your message. Like again, you might not have an art gallery to back you, but we yeah, everybody can at least project your. So just find creative ways to keep learning and stay curious. Yeah, I think my first thing is like what Soul just said in terms of being shameless. Like, you know, a couple of recent examples are like DJ Khaled and um, even Odumodu. Like, you're seeing that they drop something and like you hit them again and again and again and you're able to like bring out different forms of that same, let's say, um, subject and being able to like just keep going and going and going at it because every time at least one new person sees those things. So being able to just be consistent in terms of how like you put things on social media because every minute people are scrolling by hundreds of images. You have to give people like a reason to like stop. And even the second thing is just like, there's no pathway anymore. Like the minute someone does something and it works, like that thing is gone. It's like, it's, that's their thing. Like you have to discover like your own thing and your own particular way of how to make it work. Because even yourself, like things that worked for you last year, if you do them again, it's not going to work again. Like so many things are, I would say like responsible for things like success or something working and those conditions aren't like easily replicable so you always have to keep working and reiterating to find out what works for you at that particular time um be stubborn with what you believe in and also be patient with what you believe in um be stubborn in sen in, in sense that um as long as you believe in something and you know that it's true you just have to keep believing and then patience, what's relevant to you might not be relevant to someone now, but it could be relevant to the person later on. So as long as you're sure that you're doing something, that, something true, you just have to be patient. You have to wait for people. Sooner or later, they, they would always like come around. And then, yeah. Yeah, I agree with what everybody has said. Okay, so I agree with what everybody has said, being you know, consistent, curious, practicing, plugging yourself and putting your stuff out there all the time. Um, patience, very, very important because some of my best collabor um, collaborations, they, like, they reached out to me maybe one year after they've discovered my, my stuff, right? So I feel like that's also important, just being patient, putting your stuff out there. Someone is always watching. They may not reach out now, but they are watching. Right? And you don't know where you know, your next big collaboration or your next big exhibition or gig will come from. And also, don't depend on social media for validation. It's very, very harmful. And there are so many things controlling social media that is beyond our control as users. So it's important that you, know, you, you do not place, uh, you do not depend on social media, what people on social media that, um, are saying. Um, you don't, don't use it to determine your value as an artist. If not, you're just like 
with like all the algorithms and all of that happening, you're going to think, oh, if I'm not getting a certain number of likes, it means my work is not good. And that's a lie. Your work is great, right? So um, be true to yourself. Um, create what you want. Don't create based on what other people are telling you to create. Be inspired. Be open to insp um, inspiration from anywhere. I feel like it's, it's a bit dangerous to... Um, depend on one thing or two things for inspiration, right? So, and just explore, have fun, and practice. Yeah, I would also say stay hungry and, um, yeah, just stay hungry because that's actually what follows it. Like, if you're not asking yourself questions, like, if you're not asking yourself questions, there's no way you can actually grow. Yeah, so it's very important to stay hungry because when a man who feels like he has actually, like, gotten it all, actually hasn't gotten anything. Yeah, so, yeah. And with that, they say, if your next move doesn't scare you, then you're not making the right move, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so like, what's the next move for each of you guys? Sorry? What's, the, what's the next move that scares you? Um, for me, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like pressure. Like, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in the next five years or 10 years. I'm probably singing somewhere, do you know? Like, I don't have any plans. I'm just riding this wave. Do you understand? Yeah, like, there are no plans, and I'm not going to kill myself with any pressure. I'm just going to keep going, yeah. I think I, for someone that likes structure a lot, I agree with her, <laughs> because I also don't know where I'm going to be in the next five years or what I'm going to be doing in the next 10 years. I am sure that I will still be an artist, right? Because, I'm, I mean, it's me and art forever. It's not something you can just start and run away from whenever you like. So I agree with Iron Fair. Um, I think you should just, you know, explore and do what you like. And for me, that's what I'm doing. I also sort of recently started a clothing brand. So that's, uh, and you too, you should plug it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's also like somewhere in my future. Um, so I'll be doing that and exploring art. Nice. Yeah, I think, um... I'm preparing for my next exhibition. So it doesn't really scare me, but it's just, of course, it's like being back in that cycle because it's been, at the time, whenever I come, it's going to be two years since I did anything in Lagos. So, you know, it's like, okay, great, you know, it's good to be back and doing things like, uh, yeah. So I think that's like my next thing that's top of my head. But in five, ten years, like, who knows, man, I could be rapping. Um, I'm working on, so, well, I'm working on some music projects, art directing some music projects that are coming soon. I'm also working on a fashion retail metaverse called Astra. And we're trying to launch our version five. I'm also trying to raise some money for that. Um, also working on the vinyl toy collection called Sony. That's going to come out soon, 3D printed. And just a couple of projects. Got your yeah. fingers in many pots. Sorry? Fingers in many pots. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm doing a lot, if not too much. A lot of them I can't really talk about now because I don't want to jinx it, but there's a lot of stuff I'm, I'm working on. I'm also working on a game, which is sort of, I would say, like a pretty much Nigerian music scene, but Def Jam, New York type thing, like Thames versus Whiskey type fights. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, just something creative and edgy. Yeah. Um, I can't really share much because I have a whole lot of NDAs signed, <laughs> so I can't share. Uh, but um, I'm currently working on the Echo Tag, which is the mural by Law School or Ozumba. Um, we're redoing that. It was done six years ago. We just got approvals from the government and LCC to have it revamped. So a new artwork is coming there. Um, I have my second solo exhibition coming up later in the year. Um, it should be a touring exhibition, so we're going to be touring different cities in the world. So yeah, that's it for me this year. Um, for me, uh, uh, my lifelong goal is to design and create my own hotel. So I'm working on that. That's incredible. I've seen a lot of art residencies here as well, like 16 by 16, H Factor, like creating the spaces is that's that's cool man yeah. i guess that's it um guys thank you so much for your time can we get a round of applause for these guys please <laughs>